All right. Hello, everyone, to this much, much awaited podcast. And we have a very special guest with us. We have Chirag. Chirag is based in Canada and he works in the game industry in Canada. He is living the dream that a lot of us and a lot of you want to. And today we are going to find out about him. We're going to find out about his journey. We're going to find out how he made it. We're going to find out what it's like to actually work in the game industry in North America. We're going to find out about his journey and we're going to ask him for advice, how advice as to how you guys can also do that to welcome Chirag. And thank you so much for being a part of this podcast. I really appreciate you, you getting up on a Saturday morning and, <laughs> and uh, doing this call. So thanks very much. No problem. It's my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. Um, t- tell us about yourself. Tell us about, you know, where you are, what you do, where you live. So, yeah, my name is Chirag. Uh, I also go by Tito, which is, uh, which is a nickname. And uh, I'm living in Montreal, Canada. It's been uh, about 12 and a half years for me here in Canada, eight and a half of which have been uh, in Montreal. And uh, I'm currently working for a mobile game development studio called uh, Ludia. And uh, the company is about 15 years old, uh, about 400 odd employees. And uh, we were quite That's recently... big. 400 yeah, is, a, is big. It is. I think it's about 420 or 430, something like that. Uh, and we were recently acquired by Jam City. Ah. Uh, so there's that too. So now we're part of the Jam City family. And uh, Ludia makes games for mobile platforms. So mostly based on existing IPs uh, like Jurassic World, uh, Dragons of Burke, D&D, TMNT. Uh, we have some of our own IPs too, but uh, most of our games, we, we acquire licenses from uh, the likes of like Universal, DreamWorks, Wizards of the Coast, Disney. Uh, and we work on those uh, licenses. So I've been here for almost nine years now. And uh, previously I was uh, working as a senior game programmer uh, at the company. And most recently I've now transitioned uh, into a senior technical artist role. Awesome, awesome. Um, where where in India are you from? Like what's your home city? I'm, I'm originally from uh, uh, Bangalore. So born and raised in Bangalore. And I came to Canada in, in 2009. I was first introduced to, to games on my dad's uh, 486 sometime in the mid 90s, I think, uh, on Windows 95 operating system. Played a lot of Dota and World of Warcraft and all of that. Um, after coming to Canada, things changed a little bit. Uh, there was still a continuation of some of those like MOBA games because I remember playing League of Legends in the open beta back in 2009 when I first arrived. Uh, but also like I got introduced to a lot of uh, different kinds of games that I didn't experience uh, when I was uh, in India. And uh, a lot of it was like social games, you know, things like uh, uh, Mario Party, fighting games, rock band. We had a uh, yeah, computers, yeah, like, uh, fighting games are huge like it's yeah especially in the west i don't know if it's a canadian thing or if it's a u.s thing like people hang out you get sushi you get some beers and you fight a street fighter you know like it's the thing tell us about your beginnings as a game maker like when you went, went how you got interested how you got started yeah i mean i was always interested in games uh since i was a little kid but uh, i was also very passionate about programming and technology in general. So from a very young age, I knew I wanted to get into game development. Uh, I think one of the earlier like challenges was just the lack of guidance and the lack of clarity. It wasn't clear to me what steps are needed to take to be able to become a game developer, especially this was in like the mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of studios in India and there wasn't a lot of people doing it. It was still super young. And I was actually you know, telling a few people the other day that like the students nowadays are extremely fortunate for everything that they have, you know, people like you who are doing this, there's just so much more awareness now. And there's, there's so much more information available, Uh, just the access to technology now. And with, you know, things like discard and zoom and training material online through YouTube, Udemy, whatever, there's just so much information. So the only thing that you need is the desire to actually go and, you know, start asking questions, start looking up stuff and yeah. uh, doing those things. 
Yeah, uh, for me, I, my my first game, actually, the, the first real taste of game development, I think, was uh, in my final year of engineering. Uh, we, my friend and I, we decided to uh, to make a game for our project. And really? back then, this was yeah, this was uh, using uh, Microsoft's XNA framework back then and C Sharp. So nice. there wasn't a lot of information, and we were just trying to figure something out. And we kind of hacked together something. And I still remember, like, we, we were really happy with it. But I remember, like, the teacher when he was very surprised to see what we did. And I think he was absolutely certain that we like copied it off the internet or something like that. And I don't what even did you guys know. Make? Uh, we just made like a simple space shooter at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, it wasn't anything fancy and it was with the, it wasn't like a proper engine. It was, you know, the Microsoft XNA framework. So after that, uh, basically I came to Canada. Uh, so I'll just go over my, maybe my education uh, a, a little bit because I did my um, ICSC and ISE board in in in, in India in Bangalore, uh, and all my education was was all in Bangalore. And uh, I think ninth grade was my first elective, uh, and I picked computer science. So that was my first real taste of programming. That was uh, you know quick basic. I think back then, and then eleventh and twelfth, of course, I did computer science again, that was C++, and then I did my bachelor's in computer science engineering, which was a, a four-year program from 2005 to 2009. And uh, the same year I graduated in 2009 was when I came to Canada. So, so, so till like, then, did you make yeah. games or like with your engineering or you were just, you were not making games? No, I wasn't really making games. It was just that one game that we made during the, the final year project. But that was kind of what cemented that desire to go on, continue making more games and do it more professionally. Even though I always knew I wanted to do that, mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of that big step. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the journey to, you know, study here and, and, and follow up here, it really started because the funny thing is I didn't actually have a plan to, to go abroad and, and, and study per se. I was actually very comfortable uh, uh, in India and uh, you know, I had my friends, my, my, my life there and everything. So the thing was that the gaming industry in India was very young uh, and the opportunities there were very limited. So it was actually my, my dad who really encouraged me and wanted me to go abroad. Now tell us about, you, you, you turned up in Canada. What did you study? How did you get into games? Tell us about that. Yeah, so... Ended up in Canada in 2009, and um, yeah, the 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 one of my first actual like uh, game experiences there was a game jam. I mm -hmm. think it was in 2009 or 2010. It was uh, global the the global game jam. Global What's game happening jam. right now? Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, that was like my second real game development experience uh, apart from the one that I had done previously, and that was Sorry a lot of fun. So when you, when you went to Canada, you went there to yeah. study. Which course was that? So I went there for a master's in computer games uh, technology. So this was in Algoma University, which was a university in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, it was actually a remote program that was offered uh, through uh, University of Aberte Dundee in Scotland, which is still uh -huh. uh, currently offering, I think, uh, uh, the, the program. Okay. Uh, not the one in Algoma. So when I went to Canada, it was to do the program in uh, uh, Scotland remotely. Right. So that's what they had uh, over there. And they had their own lab and everything. And uh, everything was done remotely at the time. So that was the program. And it was a two-year program. Uh, it had a bunch of courses related to computer games technology specifically. So it was catered to uh, game development uh, specifically. So, so it was more, uh, it is, was it more tech and programming or was there design as well and art? No, this one... This one was the one that we had was strictly a, a, a technical uh, a discipline. Yeah. So it was all programming. You know, we learned uh, DirectX and uh, we had to work with the PlayStation 2 dev kits. Uh, there was a math and physics uh, 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 class as well. There was one on the games marketplace. Uh, so, yeah, they had uh, a lot of different things related to the gaming industry, but very tech focused. Excellent. So, so t tell us about what happened after that. So after that, I would say like 
my other experience working with uh, games and especially Unity was that was in the summer of 2010. So there was this uh, event that they had, uh, which was actually like a summer camp uh, for high school students, where they would bring them for about a month and uh, have them develop games in teams, which was, I thought, a really cool initiative. And they wanted some mentors for, for that, for the programming side. Uh, so I applied for that. I got the job. And uh, I had to basically teach them and mentor them on how they could develop games, uh, for, at least on the programming side, uh, in Unity. And it was really cool, but I didn't have Unity experience at the time. So uh, the month leading up to that job, I remember downloading Unity for the first time, <laughs> reading up on it and trying to find out how it works and playing around Yeah, because with it. 2010, Unity was brand new and it was the first proper game like game engine which was user friendly and everybody like unity changed the world of video games unity was like a tidal wave that just made video game development accessible for everyone right yeah absolutely i mean it was crazy actually even now looking back because i still work with unity uh where it started off and how much they've progressed it's it's insane uh you know how much they've done that was unity i think 2.x in uh, summer of 2010 so that was even before like mechanim and a lot of the stuff that was introduced in much uh, future versions so that was like my first experience of unity and that was a lot of fun and uh, i knew that you know unity would be something that I would be interested in working on in the future. And uh, a lot of the jobs that I went on to have after uh, I did end up working with Unity. Right, right. Awesome. So um, so, so once, once you finished your college, what happened yeah. then? So then I actually moved. Um, we decided to move to Montreal. This was in Ontario, the, where the univers university was. We moved to Montreal to look for a job, my roommates and I. And because the, the, the industry in Montreal is huge for, for gaming. Uh, and it was a little bit of a hard time then because, I mean, this, this is the reality and it's important, I think, that your students know because there was a good six months before I got a job. In the also, it was around the global recession, right? 2000 and 2009, things were that's bad. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, this was like, I think, uh, sometime in 2011. Um, and yeah, I was, we were all applying for jobs, me and the two, my two roommates, and both of them ended up getting jobs, uh, uh, one in the gaming industry, one in software. Right. And so, sorry, sorry to interrupt. So yeah. here I have to ask, so, uh, you had a work permit, right? Cause that's right. So the, the college you went to, they, you knew that you would have a work permit at the end of it for how long was the work permit? The work permit was for three years. You get a postgraduate work permit. Uh, once you graduate uh, from a program in Canada, you get a postgraduate work permit and allows you to work for three years on an open work permit. That means you can work for any employer. Um, so this was the permit that I was on and I was applying for different jobs. It, it took a while before we got the job um, and it was kind of hard. And I think it's important that people realize that it's not always easy to get a job. Uh, and there is a little bit of a struggle there. Once you graduate, once you have the degree, it doesn't mean that you're automatically going to get a job. There, you have to keep applying and you have to keep working on, you know, preparation and everything to be able to land that job. So, 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 so getting that job, right? Getting yeah. that first break. Uh, did you have a portfolio? Did you have games online? Because I know that was 2010. So, you know, the internet and things weren't. So did you have a website? How did you show your work? Did you say, I'm this dude, that's, I, this is my college degree, give me a job? Or did you have some games to show? Did you have a website? Did you have a portfolio? How did that work? I, I did have a website and we had some games that we kind of worked on during the, the program that uh, I had on there. Um, but I think for me, the biggest part was just trying to get the attention of the companies. Uh, there's so many places that I applied to, and I wasn't getting call. Uh, I wasn't getting calls back, um, and a lot of them uh, at the time weren't really looking to hire. Also, so it was uh, it was quite difficult to get that. And my first break was was Game Loft, um, uh, which was in Toronto. Actually, no way. My first break was Game Loft as well. Oh, that's amazing in 
yeah like 2010 january my first job at game loft that's that's quite a coincidence huh? yeah the game loft i remember like the first uh time i applied there there was like this big uh test it was like a three-hour test almost like an exam wow and uh yeah and they had like two rounds of interviews after and then I, I got the job. So I had to move actually from Montreal back to Toronto uh, to be able to work there. And th- that was the period when, you know, I was thinking about everything that I've done to break, come to that point and how much I'd invested in you know, taking a loan and going abroad and whether it's going to work out and what's going to happen. Because six months is a long time after you graduate to try and find a job. Uh, and I remember, you know, my parents telling me that, you know, just take whatever job, do something in software or uh, come back. And I was really stubborn about working in the gaming industry. And that kind of stubbornness, I guess, allowed me to persevere. And eventually I got a break uh, at Gameloft. And then things got a lot better because once you get your foot in the door and you have that experience, it makes things a lot easier going forward, especially when you have experience here. Uh, it, it gets a lot easier. Yeah, because uh, also it's expensive, right? To 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 do a course, you have to pay tuition fees, and you have to live mm-hmm. there for a year, two years. And I mean, living in Canada can be really expensive, even if you share an apartment. And for a lot of people, I mean, most people don't have that kind of money. And a lot of people will take education loans from banks, and the cost of money in India is pretty high. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 risky, you know. And I know for a fact that. Some colleges, uh, so does everyone offer a three-year permit or is there some place, some kind of courses you even get a one-year permit, do you know? Um, I think the way it works is, uh, I mean, back then, at least the postgraduate work permit was for three years. Mm -hmm. I think some of them might be a little bit less. I'm not entirely sure, but there is a list of um, educational institutions and uh, programs on the Canadian immigration website that are eligible, that make you eligible for a postgraduate work permit or a a work permit of some sort. Um, So it doesn't necessarily have to be a master's program. I think it could be other programs also, Um, but there is a list on the the website uh, that tells you which programs and which institutions will allow you to be eligible for this. I I know VFS, because VFS is private, right? VFS is a private institute. So I know at some point, they used to offer work permits and then it, it went away. I, I actually know someone who went there when there was a work permit and halfway through a program, they withdrew the, the work permit thingy. And at the end, she was like, okay, <laughs> no, so I, I don't even have a permit to work. I, I actually didn't have a work permit when I was mm-hmm. VFS at that time. And at the end of it, I actually did an internship Piranha Games in Vancouver for free like okay. i was unpaid intern so my first break was as at an unpaid qa intern at piranha games because i didn't have a work permit um but it was still amazing like i used to turn i, I saw game studio for the first time like i used to hang out you know i used to play games i used to hang out i used to observe how games were made like just to be at a real game studio and just hang out those people and help out in whatever way was amazing and you know, that was that was my foot in the door, right? And um, so, like you said, that first foot in the door can be very hard, right? And the That's clock right. is ticking because you've taken a loan. Yeah, you started paying back the EMIs for that loan, and you're not getting a job. You're not getting callbacks, and it can be very, very frustrating. And also, I mean, and the standard of people in the stand the, the standard of people in the game industry that is really high yeah. so y- you have to be good your work has to be good you have to be really professional you have to know your thing and you have to be good at talking like you have to be your english has to be good you have to mm-hmm. be able to communicate well with people get along with people um right so th- as you said that is a really really hard year maybe that people have to be willing to understand also i think a lot of people go there um thinking that they'll get straight into AAA or or make the kind of games that they idolize and they may not get that kind of job straight away 
mm-hmm. you may have to settle for something that was not your ideal game company working at a game company in where you are what's that work like how does it feel so yeah i mean it's 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 uh, it's a lot of fun uh, i didn't really work in india so i don't i can't really compare with anything uh, specifically but the work conditions are are great the work culture is great um the quality of work you know the technology and tools that you have access to the kind of projects that you get to work on um we have uh, unity enterprise support over here which is great because we get to work with unity directly uh we have access to the unity engineers uh we can we have a direct channel of communication with them we can provide feedback open bugs tickets we usually get really quick responses um the 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 they provide you know project reviews and things like that which is great um and even the people you get to work with they're very passionate lots of common interests so um it's you end up learning a lot um and for the company that i'm working at currently of course you know this the benefits are great to we have like the the public transit uh, 50% of it is covered we have access to our own gym uh we have uh, rrsp contribution which is like the retirement savings uh plan that you have they contribute towards that is access to language courses uh french and english here in montreal and access to training courses online and back when we were at the studio of course we you know we had a fully stocked kitchen get lunches on fridays we used to have happy hours on friday evenings with our own beer on tap and you know pool table ping pong foosball all that stuff so it's 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 an amazing uh, environment to to be able to work in and uh, a lot of the the studios nowadays they have designed the studios in a way that facilitates that kind of collaboration and that excitement to be able to work uh, on things together so that's a lot of fun i want to talk to the people who are watching who want to move abroad they want to do a uh, graduation here and they want to do a masters um in game development in canada and essentially that would probably be their first uh first contact with the game industry is it still possible to kind of like use that path of you know do your graduation do your you know bachelor in cse then move to canada move to the us do a masters in game development and then get a job i think one of the misconceptions that i would like to address regarding the ms is that an ms is not necessarily a guaranteed ticket into the gaming industry um uh, in fact uh there's a couple of things i want to talk about this the first part i will say is ms is not even really needed to get into the industry um i mean i have one and looking back uh the knowledge that i was tested on to land my first job the knowledge that was required to do my first job is not something that is exclusively obtained obtained from an ms uh, there's plenty of people in the industry that don't have one uh, a large number of people that i work with that don't believe have one and but the ms does kind of help solidify certain concepts uh, but you have to consider the cost especially here in north america ms programs aren't cheap by any means uh, most companies don't particularly care about it there may be some you know exceptions for research oriented roles or something like that but the vast majority don't have that as a requirement um and i do agree with that to some degree because you know if i were to hire someone personally i don't necessarily care if they have an ms as long as they demonstrate the ability to do the job well so when yeah. you say demonstrate that's that's exactly the point i'm getting at how how do you do that how do you get to a point where you can demonstrate to them that you understand how video games are made because if you're doing your ms imagine you've never made a game in your life uh, or maybe you you know you've tinkered around a little bit with unity and you come in and you do a ms and at the end of that of course you do have a certificate but when it comes to learning how to make video games maybe you have a project in your ms um which you've kind of made as part of your uh, as as part of your ms is that project good enough to get you into the game industry or is it better because what i advise people is all right man you want to work in the us do your graduation in india get some experience working in the game industry in india even if it's mobile games okay you you want you, you're a console gamer fine like what you have here is mobile games 
spend a few years making video games, understand the process of making video games. Mm -hmm. And then if you go abroad and you do your MS, your chances are much better rather than just like do your graduation here, move straight there, barely know anything about making games and then do your MS and then start looking for a job there. What do you right. have to say? Yeah, there's a couple of things that I want to say, actually, regarding the MS, uh, I'll say a few things and then I'll come back to to answer what it really, what you would need to be able to make it in the industry after you have that. So for the MS, the, the part that I wanted to touch upon was I think where the MS really uh, is beneficial is in facilitating your ability to legally work in the country. So the, the main thing here to, to remember is that unless you're a permanent resident or citizen of Canada, you need a valid work permit to be able to work in Canada. So if you're in India and you want to work in Canada, uh, technically you have three main options. Either you apply for a permanent residency, you get the status, you come to Canada and you work, or you apply for a job in Canada directly from India, right? You get accepted uh, and have the employer go through the process of obtaining you that work permit. The problem with this route is that there's labor market laws in place, which means that there are things to protect the people locally so that if there's a job that comes up, they are considered first before it goes abroad, right? Yeah, so if, if they want to hire you, they have to prove that they can't right. find a Canadian resident or citizen who for that job. There's a shortage, which is why they're employing you. They have to prove that. Exactly. So if you have no experience or very limited experience, it's not only difficult for them to prove that, but it's also not worth the time or money or energy to go through that process for you. So typically this is done for more senior roles, you know, where it actually makes sense for them to do that. So if you have a lot of experience in the industry already, then there are people from India who have come here directly without necessarily doing an MS here because they've had that experience in India and it's senior roles and the companies are willing to invest because not only can they prove that your talent is very specific and difficult to get, but it also makes sense for them to go through that process to do that because they yeah, will stand It's to not an easy process. They probably have to spend money and time and That's have right. people go back and forth. It's a complicated process. I mean, if they'd, they'd much rather hire someone local rather than go through, all, unless you're really good, unless you're like, okay, we want this person. Exactly. So I think the reason why studying abroad can be so valuable is because of this specific reason, which is it makes you eligible to apply for a postgraduate work permit, uh, at least here in Canada, which usually lasts about three years. And the best part about this work permit, unlike the one where you apply it with an employer and have them do it, is it's an open work permit. Because the other one is usually tends to be a closed work permit because the employer is not going to go through the process of giving you something open because they mm -hmm. want you to come and work for them. Right. Whereas, exactly. <laughs> so this way, when you finish like a master's program abroad, you have an open work permit, you can work for any employer in Canada. Uh, and um, it's not just MS, as I said earlier, there's a list of programs and universities uh, that are available on the website, uh, Canadian immigration website. And a lot of those will allow you to obtain uh, that, that work permit. And another thing is also once you get employment, after you get this work permit, it's not uncommon for employers to extend or renew your work permit if they like you and you know you demonstrate that you're doing a good job at work. It it's it happened to me and I was able to renew my work permit after that. Uh, and an added bonus, I would say that often people don't think about about going through the MS route is that it allows you to slowly integrate into the country, uh, understand their culture, make friends, get accustomed to the weather, the food, the language. Uh, so all of these things make it a lot easier than just showing up at a new place, joining the workforce, bam, and trying to deal with all those personal challenges on top of having to deliver at work, right? Um, but going back to what you said earlier about, so what is it that you can do to be able to get that? I would say that the expectations now are much higher than before. To be able to stand out, you have to do a lot more than just create a simple game or have a couple simple games under your belt. You have to demonstrate uh, that you can learn quickly, that you can contribute effectively, uh, you can become autonomous and you know very quickly and, and with minimal external support. Uh, and it's not that you won't get support if you want it, people are happy to help, people will mentor you. Uh, it's just that 
you know, the nature of production, sometimes you may not have that luxury because it's all hands on deck. Everyone is busy trying to meet a delivery for a milestone or something like that. So if the candidate is already able to demonstrate that, not only would it be a plus point for them, but it will also play an important role in helping them uh, integrate seamlessly into the workforce. So I would say understanding processes, industry workflows, this is why it's demonstrate because it's not just saying that you can do this, in the games that you're making, show that you understand these processes, show that you understand these workflows, uh, show that you have the knowledge of these tools like continuous integration or version control, for example. Uh, selling yourself is very, very important in addition to actually having a portfolio too. And all this is the whole package. So, you know, making sure, especially if you don't have a lot of experience, making sure the portfolio part, having a website, LinkedIn page, a well-written resume, cover letter, strong communication skills, all of these go a long way in helping you land that job. Right. Also, I don't know if it's, it's these days, solo development is a thing, right? If you tell people, people like, I made this game by myself. It was just me. I did a tutorial and I have five games and I'm like, okay, you have five solo projects. Do you have a problem working with people? If you're working in a team, there's five, you're working in five different locations. That's what the game industry is. Working by yourself is okay to learn the tools, but you really learn how to make video games when you're working with different people. And it's not just about right. the tools. It's about communication. It's about resolving creative conflict, learning how to get along. You're not going to be best friends with everyone in your game team. They're going to be people you can't you can't stand to see their face, but you still have to work with them, you know. And that's an important part of making video games. So if you're going to demonstrate that, um, the best way to demonstrate that to a potential employer is to say, okay, uh, I ha I work for this company and I was in this team. And this was my role. And I was working with a product team. I was working with the engineering manager. I was working with a testing team. Or if you're doing a course, there were five of us. And this is the role I did. And so not only do you have to uh, make a game, it's better to have a game that you made in a team and then be able to talk about what you learned from that process. Would that, would that be a fair observation? Yeah, exactly. Because it demonstrates, you know, that you're able to bridge all the things that they're looking for when it comes to actually working on a project over there with other people and with all the processes that they have. So it also communicates, I think, your ability to adapt uh, because sometimes you may be put from one project to another, you have to work with different people, maybe they use slightly different tools, uh, all of these things. So if you have projects say with different things that you've used that also can help because it shows that you you know you're not just kind of in a silo just working on the same stuff you are trying out different things you are working with other people you're working with different tools and you're working with different types of processes too so it shows that you're adaptable as well right so another question is what tools do i use like you of course do use uh, do use Unity, but I know that there are a lot of companies that actually have their own proprietary game engines, right? So yeah. uh, if someone's in India and they're like, okay, what if I want to move abroad, what would be the best programming language? What would be the best tools? Should I do Unity? Should I do Unreal? And also like, for example, if you're working with a proprietary engine, uh, it, it's probably going to be using low-level programming languages. Right. So what, right. what do you say when it comes to choice of tools and engines for someone, you know, who wants to move abroad? Um, so if you're working with in-house engines, typically the language is C++. Uh, if you're working with uh, Unreal as well, and it's mostly C Sharp for Unity. Uh, but I think the, the main focus over here is not necessarily trying to get experience with a lot of tools uh, so much so that you understand the fundamentals so that it communicates to them that no matter which tool 
you will be able to understand it because you're able to map your knowledge, existing knowledge from what you've learned from one tool to another. It may not be the same way in which you do it in another one, but it's a very similar way. So you understand those concepts. So you're able to make those connections. Okay, this is how I did it on Unity. So there must be a similar way of doing it over here. How does that work? Being able to look up the documentation, being resourceful, trying to understand, uh, read up on how things are implemented and following that. All of those things will allow you to be able to uh, adapt to whatever in-house engine or whatever tools that they use. It's impossible, virtually impossible for you to have like an experience of every single tool and at that level of depth that you may have with say Unity, which you've used a lot, right? So I think one of the things that experience really helps with in terms of trumping over other things is that it communicates that if you've been in the industry for this long and then you understand all these things, I could probably give you a new engine tomorrow and you'll be able to produce something with it. It's not because you have experience with that engine per se, but you understand the fundamentals, you understand the processes that you can easily kind of take that from one experience engine, and plug it into another one. The other. Exactly. The next thing I want to ask you, Chirag, is tell us a few common mistakes that you've seen people make. Because I'm sure I'm not the first one who's saying, dude, you, you're making video games in, in, in the West. Tell me about it. So I'm sure you've observed people mm -hmm. who want to get in the game industry, who you want to work in, kind of emulate what you've done. So what are the common mistakes that you see people making who want to choose a career path um, similar to yours? So one thing we kind of touched upon already, which is applying directly to companies here with little to no experience. Um, another thing would be trying to be too picky or over-specializing, uh, especially if you're relatively inexperienced in the industry. Uh, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. It's okay if it's something that's maybe a little bit adjacent to what you were originally looking for. There's always room for moving around within the industry. Uh, in fact, it's encouraged a lot nowadays. Uh, so people have different you know, room to grow. Um, but it also allows you to kind of have time to then figure out what you really enjoy doing and to move towards that direction. So I think the focus should be on getting your foot in the door. And once you've gained experience here, uh, gained experience here, then it, things are going to get much easier going forward, uh, as, we, as I said earlier. Uh, in fact, you'll notice like a night and day difference on LinkedIn, especially like, you know, when you're inexperienced, you're applying to places and you don't end up hearing back. And once you have a couple of years experience, you'll have all these recruiters bombard you on LinkedIn with messages and you have all these places that are trying to get you. So yeah, it, yeah. it does make a huge difference having that experience and focusing on getting that experience uh, rather than trying to get something very specific. Uh, so it helps if you kind of open up a little bit yeah it's like what i tell you, you got to find the fun just because you're not you're not offered a job making the games you play um try something new like seven years ago i was offered a role in the casino game industry right and i was like casino really but then once i got in i started enjoying it do you know what i mean like i i got to like it so give it a chance like as you said get your foot in the door don't be too picky and once you're in who knows? You may actually like that thing. And if yep. you don't do that for a couple of years, and then you'll get more chances to move on, right? Uh, I think it's important to manage your expectations too, because as you said, like people, they think that as soon as they graduate, they're going to get a job. Uh, it may take weeks, it may take months, it may take a year before you get a job. People think that the job they get is going to be at the you know, developer of their dreams, working on the title of their dreams. You have to be able to curb those expectations because it's not always the case. The first game you end up working on may be Fashion Icon. Uh, I say that because it was the first game I worked on in the industry at Gameloft, okay? So, you know, you know the it was The first game exact... I worked on, the first game I worked on was a Pokemon ripoff. Um, okay. I never used to, I never played Pokemon, right? And then all of a sudden joined Gameloft and they are making a game called Crystal Monsters, which is a Pokemon ripoff. So I had to learn Pokemon in a month. And at one point I was like, in the beginning, I was like, oh God. And then a month later, I was like, this is actually fun, you know? Right. Yeah, that's it. It's it. You, you may never know without having that experience or discovering something, you may never know what it's like. So uh, I think it's always uh, nice. And, you know, like I said, I worked on Fashion Icon as my first game and 
never in my wildest dreams that I imagined that, you know, my first project was going to be something like that. And when I told people I was going abroad and going to work in the gaming industry, I don't think <laughs> me or my friends uh, had that in mind when I told them, you know, I was going to do that. So, but after you get experience, the thing is, then you get to a point where you get to, you know, work on things that you're interested in or work on projects or tech that you're interested in. So you have to kind of, you know, go past that initial phase. Uh, you, you know, beggars can't be choosers at the beginning. You just want to try and get whatever you get. And then once you have experience, things will get a lot easier. Um, one more thing that I would like to touch upon is, and this is kind of important because uh, for experienced folks that may apply, uh, relocation packages and stuff like that, that they may get, you have to keep in mind that sometimes those things are tied to a particular contract. So if you do decide to split ways, you are expected to pay back a percentage of that amount. Uh, so people may not be thinking about that. And most of the time it's a closed work permit. So it's not like you just come and then after you can go work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, the company has invested a lot in bringing you there. So they do expect a certain amount of commitment when they do that. Uh, but work experiences, qualifications, titles, these are all things that you have to remember may not get valued the same way that they're valued say where you're from. Uh, and depending on the location, the employer, your educational institution or degree may not be recognized uh, in the same way an equivalent degree here uh, in North America may be uh, recognized. Uh, and also the title, the seniority, for example, in India, I see in, on LinkedIn, especially a lot of people who have a couple years of experience, they have the senior title, you know, senior programmer or whatever. Uh, here, typically a senior would be eight, 10 years in the industry for you to get that title. So you have to manage some of those expectations as well, just because you were a senior at an indie studio you know, in India, you may not necessarily be considered a senior over here, especially given the kind of experience that they may be looking for. Right, right. All brilliant points. Um, so almost to wind up one last thing we talked about AAA versus other companies, right? Everyone, not everyone, a lot of people I talk to are obsessed with getting into the AAA game industry, especially in North right. America. And I tell them, are you sure just because playing those games is fun, it's not necessarily the case that actually working in those AAA companies is going to be equally good. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say that, like, uh, as you said, play just because you enjoy playing, it doesn't mean that you're going to have fun working on it. I know a lot of people who deliberately avoid working on games that they enjoy playing because they don't want to ruin that experience of playing the game when they go through the hardships of developing a game because it's not all hunky-dory, right? There's a lot of hardships involved in developing a game. It's a serious work. And sometimes you have these phases where you've seen the game at its worst and you may not want to play the game after that. <laughs> uh, so there's that aspect of it. But the other side is also you know, AAA is not the be all and all of everything. Like there's so much more to game development than AAA uh, games. And you can have a fantastic career in, in game development without even touching what's conventionally called uh, AAA titles. And now even in the mobile industry, you have your AAA equivalents where a lot of, you know, money, there's huge big budget games being developed on mobile uh, and you still end up learning a lot and doing a lot of cool things. So tr again, it goes back to try not to be too narrow-minded in what you want to get. Uh, op keep your options open. Not only will, you know, it allow you to get a job easier, it will also expose you to other experiences that you may not have considered uh, that end up pleasantly surprising you. And maybe you will end up, you know, doing those things that you hadn't considered at all. Awesome. Absolutely brilliant stuff. So to wind up, uh, Chirag, mm -hmm. it's been awesome. Uh, to wind up, uh, this is Vijay. Okay, Vijay is doing his B-Tech at an engineering college somewhere. He plays games. He loves to play video games. And he wants to be a game programmer. And he wants to move to North America and be... And join the game industry there. Like he's he's in B Tech right now. What would you say to him? Just so, like a summary of the advice right. you would give to Vijay. So if if you're serious about it, do it. 
you know, uh, but make sure that you understand all the pros and cons of doing something like that, because it's not a trivial decision by any means. It is a big decision. Do you research on the location, the type of program, the specific roles uh, in the industry? Try talk to uh, recent graduates or current students that may be in a similar situation as you that could help you. Honestly, it's one of the most memorable and exciting experiences, you know, embarking on a new journey to a new land to start a new chapter in life. So for those people, I wish them the best and I hope they find uh, success in what they set out to achieve. Right. That was brilliant, Jirat. Thank you so much. And, and also, guys who are watching, uh, Chirag does from time to time appear on the Gamer to Maker server, you know, he's, 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 he's very generous. Guest appearance. He, yeah, he makes a guest appearance. <laughs> uh, lots of people come, lots of people ask questions. So I think whenever he's bored, sometimes he, he goes on Discord and he answers, and he really answers questions brilliantly. Like I've, I've, I, when I've woken up in the morning, I've seen like paragraphs written by him talking to people giving advice um and who knows maybe someday we can uh, get you chirag to do a couple of sessions uh with the with the people in you know with my students in the gamer to make a course it would be really nice to have you as a guest mentor whenever you have time that would be absolutely fantastic um if you can find time for that sure so i um, love that <laughs> Guys, so yeah. I'm going to put uh, Chirag's LinkedIn profile in the description so you can check him out, you know, send him a connection request on LinkedIn and do have a look at his career graph, look at his LinkedIn profile, see what he does and take inspiration um, and come join the game to make a server. And who knows, you might, uh, you might be able to get in touch with Chirag. So thank you so much for taking out this time on Saturday morning. I'll leave you back to enjoy your weekend. Chirag, thank you so much. Thank you so and much. I really appreciate the opportunity as well. And it was fantastic talking to you. And uh, I'm, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm always uh, happy to answer questions and things like that. <laughs> but whenever I get a chance, I'll hop in and, and try and uh, help out when people ask questions. So it's my pleasure. And I'm definitely looking forward to collaborating more as well, if time permits, so we can keep the conversation going. Thank you and have you have a good weekend, Chirag. Bye. Thanks, Raul. Bye-bye.